good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another thrilling, exciting, exploring by the seat of your pants program with us here. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm your virtual adventure guide for today, and I'm so thankful that you guys are joining us as we continue our mission of celebrating the coolest scientists, explorers, and amazing places on this planet with you. If you are new to us, we have done over 25 programs in January alone. We have been to Costa Rica, India, the Philippines, South Africa, Rwanda, Antarctica, and more places that I can't even fit into one breath. But today, we are continuing our epic series in conjunction with the amazing Mountain Park at Parks Canada. If you want to check out this entire series, I really encourage you to go to the link below. It has been an amazing journey over the last couple of years. We've got many more coming up in the months to follow, but today we're going to dive in with a really exciting topic that I'll announce in just a second after I do my housekeeping note of our Kahoot today. So, if you're new to our Peak Discovery series, if you're new to exploring by the seat of your pants, what we love to do is keep it interactive in between the talk and the Q&A, the live Q&A portion at the end. And to do that, we use something called a Kahoot. If you're new to Kahoot, it's gonna be a four question quiz, interactive, fun, engaging between the talk and Q&A portion. You can pull up Kahoot.it with this special game pin uh, in between, and we will play along with that four question quiz after Lori has done her presentation. Now today, we are gonna to continue one of our favorite topics here, and that is restoration, bringing back ecosystems to their former glory and health to make sure that they're there for all sorts of wildlife and people for decades and centuries and millennia to come. Specifically, we're going to talk about the amazing Cascade Creek, one of the most beautiful places in one of the most beautiful parks within the gem of Canada's national park system with Banff National Park. Uh, I'm going to stop talking momentarily and turn it over to Lori to blow your minds. Thank you so much to our 78 classes for registering today. It's our biggest audience so far of 2023. And I really appreciate you all being here. Lori, thanks so much for being a part today and, and welcome to the broadcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, we are so excited to get underway. we got so many kids, as you know. So if you want to dive right in, we are, are good to go with that presentation. Let's do it. <laughs> Perfect. Here we go. Well, hello, bonjour, everybody. My name is Lori, and I work for Parks Canada here in beautiful Banff National Park, as Jesse said. So welcome to a live stream from a live stream. Today, we're going to find out how Parks Canada is restoring Cascade Creek and why that was important for the health of our park. First, we acknowledge that Banff National Park is within the present day territory of Treaties 6, 7 and 8, as well as the Métis homeland. The lands and waters of Banff have been used for millennia by Indigenous peoples for sustenance, ceremony, trade and travel. We thank them for their continuous stewardship and for sharing the land with us. Now, what is Parks Canada all about? It's the job of our Parks Canada team to look after Canada's natural and cultural heritage. So let me know in the chat if you've ever visited Banff. I know some of you are neighbors. <laughs> How about another national park near you or a national historic site? Or maybe you've even visited a marine conservation area. These are all places that Parks Canada takes care of. So we protect animals, plants, landscapes, and historic sites now and for future generations, and I get the privilege of sharing our special stories with you. And one of the principles that guides our work at Parks Canada is called ecological integrity. It's a big word, but it means just means simply that an ecosystem is healthy and whole. And this me includes both living and non-living parts, along with all the processes that they need. So let me dive into that a little bit more. In the Rocky Mountains, some of the non-living parts of this ecosystem are things like rocks, glaciers, wind, water, and sunshine. We can see the living parts of the ecosystem all around. Plants, animals, fungi, and even bacteria that we can't see. And tying all of this together are the processes of life. Birth, growth, reproduction, death, and decay, as well as non-biological processes like seasons, avalanches, fires, and floods. And when everything is in place and functioning in balance, that's what we call ecological integrity. And striving for this balance guides every decision that we make at Parks Canada. In the Canadian Rockies, some of the most important but least understood ecosystems are the aquatic ones, lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands. And wherever there's water, there are living things. The animals and plants in aquatic ecosystems are all connected and dependent on each other in complex food webs. For example, the sun feeds plants and algae 
that are eaten by bugs, that are eaten by fish, that are eaten by birds, and so on. So tell me in the chat, can you name any mammals that live in a marsh or a stream? There are a couple of them pictured here, just for a hint. And one of them is actually the symbol of Parks Canada. That's right, the beaver. So Parks Canada protects aquatic ecosystems, and if they've been damaged, we try to work to restore them. Today, I'm going to show you one of those projects. It's the story of a river, or rather what used to be a river. This river's name was the Cascade. It started as melting snow and rain collecting in trickles high up in the mountains, and it grew in size as other streams joined it. This is the course of the old Cascade River drawn in blue. It used to run along the, alongside the corner of Lake Minnewanka, past the old mining towns of Bankhead and Anthracite, and it went all the way to the Bow River. Lake Minnewanka was a spot that was always popular with tourists. From the very start, though, they began to make changes. A small town grew up on the lake shore where people enjoyed boating and fishing. And these waters teemed with fish, species like bull trout and west slope cutthroat trout. The trout were caught in huge numbers, but people also wanted more varieties of fish to catch. So they released types of trout that were not native to the Rockies into Banff's waters species like brook trout and rainbow trout. And these new fish began to outcompete and multiply, and they were competing for the native trout and uh, the cutthroat trout and the bull trout for living space and food. And new challenges were also on the way for the native trout. By 1912, electricity was becoming important to the growing community in Banff. So a small dam was built on the river to run a power station downstream. But the demand for electricity kept increasing. Some people thought that the river should be dammed up completely and that Lake Minnewanka should be turned into a huge reservoir for hydroelectric power. But others were looking to the future of how national parks could be places for nature. And by 1930, Canada passed the National Parks Act. This legislation meant that industry like mining, logging, and building power dams could no longer happen within national parks. But just nine years after the Park Act was passed, World War II broke out. Canada's factories began churning out weapons and supplies for the war, and they needed electricity, and lots of it. So to help the war effort, Canada overruled the National Parks Act, and the Minnewanka Dam was built in 1941. Water from the new dam was sent by canal and pipes to a tower that creates water pressure, and then the water goes into pipes underground, to run generators in the power station. is actually still producing power from the Lake Minnewanka Dam to this day. So when you drive between Banff and Canmore, you can see the power station right beside the Trans-Canada Highway, just a few kilometers east of Banff. The dam blocked the Cascade River and its water backed up into Lake Minnewanka. Water levels rose by 30 meters or about 98 feet. The whole valley was flooded. This lake is, this is the lake as we know it today, what we're seeing here, the deepest and longest lake in Banff National Park. And here you can see a part of the dam built where the Cascade River used to flow. These are the floodgates that release water from the lake if necessary. And in another part of the dam, a small pipe behind this structure released a bit of water into the old riverbed bit by bit, but with this reduced flow, the river shrank to less than 1% of its original size. The lower reaches of the Cascade no longer had enough water to connect with the Bow River. Without enough flow, it all seeped into the gravelly ground. Good fish habitat was lost. So a river that had once looked like this, over time, became like this. Here's the old riverbed right beside the Trans-Canada Highway and the Legacy Trail. Definitely no fish here. And when there, where there will, was still some water in the creek bed, it began to clog up with silt and sediment because there was no fast water to wash it all away. So mud and silt filled in the gravel beds that the native trout needed to lay their eggs. And some of the non-native fish were able to survive 
but the cutthroat and the bull trout, our native species, disappeared from the cascade. And this is the way that it stayed for many years. But by the 1990s, people's attitudes about parks had begun to change. More and more, Parks Canada wanted to restore damaged habitats. And so we began thinking about how we could bring back um, the Cascade as a creek. It might never be the river that it once was, but perhaps it could be a healthy place where native trout could live again. And that was how the restoration of Cascade Creek began. And here to tell us all about it is our special guest, Helen Irwin. She's the expert who's been overseeing the whole project. Creek Restoration Project in Banff National Park. So in 1941, uh, we had a major dam built in the park here that diverted the Cascade River, essentially drying up nine kilometers of what was a river. And in the 1990s, Parks Canada recognized that this really wasn't acceptable in a national park. We could do better. And we wanted to restore this ecosystem. The restoration began in 2010. 70 years worth of sediment needed to be cleared away from the creek's gravel beds to create good fish habitat. This was going to be an enormous job. In June of 2013 though, Mother Nature stepped in and something unexpected happened that moved the project forward dramatically. Heavy rains caused devastating floods throughout South southern Alberta, including Banff. These floods washed out highways, bridges, homes, and businesses, causing billions of dollars in damage. And the rising water also threatened the safety of the Minnewanka Dam. If it continued to fill up this quickly, it could overflow and the walls might burst. They had to take the pressure off somehow. And so for the first time since it was built, the dam's emergency floodgates were opened up. Millions of liters of water roared down the old river channel. It tore away roads and trails and trees and carved itself a new path along the length of the old dry riverbed. Now, why is water so powerful and destructive? Well, because one cubic meter of water, that is a cube one meter by one meter by one meter in size, weighs 1,000 kilograms or a full metric ton. And when thousands of cubic meters of water are on the move, nothing can stand in its way for long. This helicopter view of the aftermath shows the entire road by Cascade Ponds was washed away by the flood. And here's what that section of road looked like before the flood and after. These culverts had never been designed to handle such large amounts of water. But despite the destruction it caused, the water had one beneficial effect. Remember that 70 years of silt and sediment building up in the creek that Parks Canada wanted to get rid of? Well, that was now gone, all washed away in just a couple of days. So that was actually a pretty good thing for the restoration project. But one thing was not so good. Before the flood, the lower half of the creek had looked like this. But now, with the force of the water, Large sections of the riverbed had been scoured away and its edges heavily eroded. And all that was left was a flat, rocky channel, too wide for a small creek. The water would simply be just too shallow and warm for fish to survive if we simply tried to put water back into this system. Parks Canada realized that to get the fast, deep creek that, we, that the fish needed, it would have to be constructed. So experts were brought in to design and create a whole new creek, something that was made by humans, but that would mimic nature. They used heavy machinery to dig a new, more narrow channel out of the old riverbed so that the water could run a little bit deeper. But building a creek is much more than just digging a channel. Good fish habitat is made up of many different elements, 
all of them things that the crews would need to replicate. Using gravel and boulders, they began to create the kind of natural features that fish and insects need in a stream. Things like deep pools where the water moves slowly, and then faster, shallow sections called riffles. Riffles. It's a cool word, hey? Here's Helen to describe what they are and why they're important. So riffles and pools are habitat features in streams, and they provide the different types of habitat that fish need in order to meet all of their different life needs. So a riffle, as you can see, has really fast flowing shallow water and you get that white foam happening, that's bubbles. So what's happening is a lot of air is being put into the stream and where you have a lot of sunlight as well. So shallow water means the sun can penetrate and that air, you get a lot of stuff growing in there and that provides food for bugs and the bugs in turn provide food for the fish. So they're like the feeding stations for the fish. And behind the ripple, you'll get a nice deep pool form. And that deep water provides cover for fish so that they can hide from predators and they can also rest. And that's why they're both really important. And so the new creek was beginning to take shape. But to make sure that it would be a success as a living stream, the restoration team had to do a number of things. They had to ensure that enough water was coming out of the dam to maintain the new creek all year round. The original pipe seen here on the left was too small to carry the volume of water needed. So a new pipe was installed that could handle much larger amounts of water. With the increase in output from the dam and the channel engineering through the lower reaches of the creek, there was enough flow in Cascade Creek to reach the Bow River once again by the summer of 2019. And Parks Canada is working towards an agreement with the company that operates the dam to ensure that enough water continues to flow into Cascade Creek. Looking ahead, it's also going to be important to increase the amount of water from time to time to mimic the spring floods that flush the system. And this will prevent sediment buildup and keep the stream clean and clear. Road and railway culverts were washed out in the flood. And as these were repaired, they were replaced with bigger ones with better structures. To handle this uh, larger flow of water in the creek all year round and to be able to withstand future floods as well. And Parks Canada had to repair the contents of the creek as well. Remember that brook trout and rainbow trout were two species of fish that were brought in to stock the lakes and streams in the early days of the park? Well, unfortunately, they had a devastating effect on the park's native West Slope cutthroat trout and bull trout, to the point where they were listed as a species at risk. And if the West Slope cutthroat trout and bull trout were going to make a home in the new Cascade Creek, then the invasive brook and rainbow trout had to be removed. And the team used a method called electrofishing. That's where electricity is applied directly to the water. It temporarily stuns the fish and it allows it to be caught in a net. So bit by bit, the invasive fish were gradually removed from the creek. Brook trout and rainbow trout are aggressive fish that compete with the native trout for food and living space. And in the case of the rainbow trout, there's a whole other problem. They can actually interbreed with the West Slope cutthroat trout. And when that happens, that will produce a hybrid fish that's not completely one or the other, but a mix of the two. And over time, that can lead a lake or river to be completely populated with hybrids with no genetically pure cutthroat trout left. So it's very important that in this new Cascade Creek, our West Slope cutthroat trout have no interaction with the rainbow or brook trout. To ensure that the habitat would be a secure location for the West Slope cutthroat trout, the team constructed a fish barrier at the bottom of the creek. This drop-off prevents any kind of fish from swimming up the Cascade Creek from Bow River. So the West Slope cutthroat trout can live in the Cascade Creek without having to compete with any other types of fish, but they can swim across the barrier heading downstream to expand their home into the Bow River. But our work isn't finished yet. Right now, our job is to stabilize the creek banks with native plants. 
Their roots hold the sand and the gravel in place so that the banks don't wash away. Plants at the water's edge are called riparian plants. They're a big part of the healthy fish stream. And here's Helen to tell us about it. Vegetation along stream banks plays a lot of really important roles. It helps to stabilize the bank. So when you have floods, you still maintain a good shape to your channel. It helps provide shade for the stream, which keeps the water nice and cold. And here in the mountain parks, that's what our native species need is cold, clean water. Uh, they also help to filter pollutants that could feed into the stream. Uh, and they provide bugs and leaves and things that drop into the stream that help feed the fish in the stream as well. So a lot of really important functions along the stream channel. So to get all these plants into the ground along these stream banks is a lot of work and many hands make light work. And we have a ton of amazing volunteers that come out and help us with planting all of these plants. And they work really hard while they're out here and have a great time. And it makes a huge difference to this project and to restoring this ecosystem. We've essentially accelerated the recovery of the vegetation along the stream banks by about 10 to 15 years. All these steps that we have taken are in order to make the creek ready for fish. The fish that we especially want to reintroduce is the West Slope cutthroat trout. Why are we so concerned about this fish in particular? Well, it's a species at risk, meaning that its existence is threatened. In fact, it lives in less than 5% of the area that it used to inhabit. And Parks Canada pays special attention to any species that are listed as threatened and does everything possible to ensure their continued existence. Cutthroat trout need water that is clean, cold, and clear, and unpolluted. So there's a neat method that we can use to find out just how clean a creek's water is. We study its bugs. Banff National Park is home to many types of flying insects. This stonefly, this caddisfly, or this mayfly are some examples. They're important food for many types of birds and bats. But did you know that many of these insects begin their lives underwater? looking entirely different from their adult forms. Here's what they look like in their underwater form. As nymphs or larvae, these bugs are perfect food for fish like trout. So insects are an essential part of the food web, both for creatures that fly and for creatures that swim. And let's see how Helen collects a sampling of bugs from a riffle in the creek. So I've got my waders here to keep me dry while I'm in the stream. I've got my net and I'm going to go in the stream and I'm going to kick up some bugs. So we've done our kick in the stream and we pulled out of the net all of the bugs that we found in our net. So these are all the bugs that are making their home in the stream. So in this stream, we have some mayflies, some stoneflies, and some caddisflies. So if you have certain kinds of bugs in the stream that are sensitive to pollution, if you have a lot of those, then that means you actually have very little pollution and a very healthy stream. We're going to be reintroducing native trout into this stream and these bugs tell us that there's a lot of really good food for the fish, uh, which means it's a great place to reintroduce the fish. And there's still lots of work to do, but we are planning for the very first release of West Slope Cutthroat Trout this summer, 2023, so that a new population of this species at risk will be established in this protected place. It's just one part of Parks Canada's larger plan to restore ecosystems throughout our parks and make them healthy again. So we've gone from this to this. Cascade Creek now runs alongside the legacy trail that goes between Banff and Canmore. And it's a great place to walk or bike so you can see the restoration project in action.
And after all this work, Cascade Creek is now full of cold, clean water year round. The channel is the right size and there are pools for fish to rest in and riffles where they can forage for food. The gravel of the creek side has been planted with shrubs, grasses, and flowers so that the growing roots help hold the bank together. And when these plants shed their leaves into the water, they feed many kinds of bugs that will make great food for the fish. And that is how Cascade Parks Canada is restoring Cascade Creek to become a thriving aquatic habitat. And remember, we can always use your help. You can still volunteer on the Shoreline Planting Project. There's more to do. Or simply visit Banff National Park and enjoy Cascade Creek in person. It flows through the Cascade Ponds, which is a popular picnic area near the town of Banff. And I heard one of our Canmore teacher friends say that they know it well. So check out the Parks Canada website to find out more about Cascade Creek and its restoration. And remember, you can help creeks and rivers everywhere by conserving water in your own home and keeping it clean. Thanks to Helen Irwin for being our special guest today. And now I'm going to throw it back to Jesse to get to our Padlet and answer any questions you might have. Oh, well, Lori, that was an extraordinary journey. I never knew that I wanted to do a little dance in the stream to shimmy up some bugs before, but now next time I come to Alberta, I'll have to join you for that. And I think Creative Kid Blake on YouTube sums up our thoughts from all of us. Just awesome about the whole presentation. So way to go. Uh, I'm, we are going to do it with our Kahoot, as, as Lori mentioned. So get ready with those questions, too. We're coming to you guys shortly. There's already over 50 of you in our Kahoot. But if you want to pull up Kahoot.it with this game, then we're going to go brief little quiz together. Lori, you can help us out when there's a few seconds left in every single one of these so we can get some, uh, uh, I guess, hints before we finish up when we're done. But let's pull this up for everyone. While we're pulling this up for one more quick second, you noted caddisflies, and I would not be a card-carrying nerd and biology buff if I didn't encourage all of you to go check out Caddisfly House. When you're done this broadcast, go look up Caddisfly House, and it's the freakiest, coolest thing in nature. It's one of my favorite things in the insect world uh, as a follow-up to today's program. Now, over 60 of you are already in. For those who are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Now, you don't win anything, but you do win Lori and I's everlasting respect. And so that, I think, is worth something more than its weight in gold, perhaps. We'll see how it goes. But we're going to get underway. About 20 seconds per question. Live stream from a live stream. My favorite title in some time. Here we go. Question one. Were you guys paying attention? What do Banff's native fish species need? Do they need protected habitat, cold, clear water, bugs to eat, or all of the above? And for anyone who's ever done a Kahoot with me before, you'll know that there's an answer that I particularly like when we have questions like this. Let's see. Six seconds left, Lori. I mean, seems mm. like some of those things might be sort of, you need more than one, maybe. I don't know. I, probably oh. more than one of those. And ah! Two people got that right. Way to go, everybody. Okay, let's check our leaderboard. Glad Dingo, the least Canadian animal of all, is our leader so far. Let's head to our second question. So this is a multi-select, so there might be more than one answer here. Why is it important to plant shrubs and grasses at the side of the creek? Is it because they look nice? They're so handsome. Look at that green. Is it because they provide food and shelter for bugs and fish? Is it because they hold the stream bank together in case of floods? Or maybe it's more than one of those things. Maybe it's all three of those things. Who knows? What do you think? Maybe one's a little different from the others there. Not quite as important. We think we about tripped. what Parks would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a lot of you got this right. It is B and C. It is providing food and shelter for bugs and fish. It's holding the stream bank together. Lori was highlighting that at the end of the program today. Way to go to those of you who got that. And it completely changed our, our leaderboard up. Swift Sea Lion now in the lead uh, as we go into question three. All right. How did the 2013 flood help the Cascade Creek Restoration Project? Did it wash houses away? Did it wash sediment and silt away from the old riverbed? Or it broke the dam? We just got rid of the dam entirely. It was quite the quite the flood. What do we think? This is a big part of our talk today, so I hope you guys get it. It was quite the flood. If it had broken the dam, that would have been a major disaster. Yeah, we, we don't want major disasters. Now, 76, wow, there's like 100 of you in this now. That's crazy. Uh, wash sediment and silt away is our correct answer. Way to go. Where does that put our leaderboard? Oh, Swift Sea Line, to, as we go into our final one. Now, this one I will note 
is not worth points. We just wanted to get your opinion. What do you think? Did you learn something new today? A lot? Did you learn a lot? Like me? Did you learn a little? Just a tiny bit? You knew some of this before, but, you know, picked up a few new things. Or, no, you are actually one of the Cascade Creek Restoration Biologists, and you knew all of this before you even came today. You're wondering why you showed up at class at all. So any one of those three, no wrong answer. We just love to get a sense from you guys. Lori, I'm hoping. I think I, you know, I think a lot of people are going to be in the same boat. Most people learned a lot. That's exciting. And 22 biologists from Cascade Creek were in the audience today, which is very, very exciting as well. Um, so our final tally, if you are any of these people, let us know who you are in the chat. If you're on YouTube, please feel free to share questions. I'd love to take your queries as well. And we're going to head to uh, grade four, seven person school in a minute for our first live question. But our winner, Swift Sea Lion, way to go, bravo. Yay! It's vaguely aquatic, I like it. Um, all right, we're gonna remove our Kahoot, way to go. Thanks for playing along, everybody. And seven person school, if you guys wanna come on in grade fours and take us away, here we go. All right. Hey, Ronan, what's the question you have? Hi, Ronan. Oh, hey, Ryder, Ryder, what's the oh, question? Quick, guys, who had the question? <laughs> Sorry, there, this is live. You gotta be quick. <laughs> no. Who had the question? Anybody? Anybody? Mm. Go for it. Come on. We had, I said, think of a question. Sorry. I can come back. I can come back. No worries. Okay, come back. Okay. You, you ponder. Put your thinking caps on, and we'll head to Miss Hoff's grade fours instead. Come on in, guys. Hi. 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 Do you have any questions for Lori about the creek and the stuff they're the doing creek? in Banff? Chance? Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. Stand up. Stand up. I forgot. He forgot. It's oh. a lot of pressure. <laughs> it's pressure. It's, it's, I, whew, it's a lot right now. So, Lori, out of curiosity, we're, we're re-releasing the fish coming up this summer. That's really, really exciting. As a question to sort of spark some interest, maybe, and get our kids with their thinking caps on. Is there a timeline? Are you hoping that this will be fully restored by 2040, by three weeks next Tuesday? Is there like a sense you have how long this might take? It's going to be an ongoing process. So uh, the, definitely getting the planting completed is going to be a big part of that. As Helen noted in her clip there, um, getting the planting done is putting that project about 10 to 15 years ahead uh, toward completion uh, versus just letting the plants kind of naturally spring up in the dirt and gravel, just because it's kind of a hard place to get a foothold in that very cold soil um, along that creek. So that's it's going to be kind of an ongoing process, but getting the fish back in there this summer is going to be a major step. Yeah, and amazing how much you've advanced the timeline just by that one extra step of showing up the bank. Like this is the thing about having scientists and people that really know what they're doing involved in these projects is that you can sort of assess the ecology, get that understanding and sort of make informed decisions to make things go better faster, which is what this is all about. Um, all right, seven persons. Now you've got a bunch of students up at the camera. So I'm gonna come back to you guys. Come on in. Hi. Hi. What was the Cascade Creek named after? Ooh. Oh, that's a great question. It's named after the Cascade Mountain that was named by uh, the Palliser Expedition because it has a big waterfall flowing off of the east side of it. Ooh. That was, Lori, I must say, just a professional detachment at the window. Very good to know that so quickly offhand. That's like a tricky question. That's a stumper one. I like <laughs> it. Um, we're going to head back to everyone in a minute, so stay tuned with those questions. Uh, we're going to head to our Canmore class. 5E, if you guys want to unmute your mic, you are good to go. And I'll, I'll come on in and you're right down the road from Cascade Creek. Hi. Amica, would you like to ask a question? How long will it take to restore the fish? Yeah, how long will the fish specific, Lori? Yeah, so once once we put those fish back in the creek, hopefully this summer, um, then they're hopefully restored and they'll just go on having more little fish and that there will be a population of fish, but we're going to definitely be keeping an eye on them. Uh, we need to make sure that the water is cold enough for them, that it's deep enough for them and that they're getting enough food as well. So we're going to be watching this for a few years to come. Awesome. All right, Ms. Laferriere's class, uh, they joined in just a second after I got underway, so I didn't get the chance to say hi to them at the beginning, but their golden class has a question. I want to find out what makes them golden, too. That's very exciting. But okay. you're, if you're unmuted, hi, Ms. Laferriere's yes. class. Hi. Why are we a golden class? Yeah. I got a hairy We're in golden. We're in golden. <laughs> nice. Very cool. All right. Well, welcome so in. Share with us. <laughs> 
Uh, your question was how did they got this? Where they got the trout? Where is the trout? Where, 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 where are you guys gonna get trout from? Going Where do we get the trout from? We collect the eggs of the West Slope cutthroat trout and then we breed them uh, to restore the creek. So we raise them in an aquarium for a little while and then they get put back into the creek into the wild. How cool is that? That What a cool job to be like an aquarium manager at Parks Canada where you're getting to help raise fish that are going to be released into the wild. I don't know if any of our students have ever had the chance to release fry back into a stream or pond or lake, but it's such a special experience. I hope you, you get that chance in your lives. It's so much fun. Mr. Fortas, now we had some weird tech things before we got live today. So if we're going to unmute, hope for the best, and worst case, we'll take it in the chat. But I'm going to come with eternal optimism. I don't know if we resolved it. Hold on. There. How's that? That's much better. That is much better. Okay. So, yeah. Hi! Wait, I'm going to get on camera. Does anybody have a question? What's our question today, guys? I can't hear. I have a question. Okay, question? Yeah. Stephanos. How was the river made? Ah, yeah. The river existed a long, long time ago. Um, many, many thousands of years ago, we had glaciers carving the mountains and, and creating uh, valley bottoms. And that's where the rivers would flow. So that's like way, way back how the river was made. But then um, after the dam went in, that pretty much dried up. And when the flood went through, it washed clean the old riverbed. And we just did a few touch-ups with some heavy machinery to make the right grade and size for the new Cascade Creek. So that's how we made it in modern times. Very cool. I love the pictures with the heavy machinery. That's got to be such a fun gig again. And it speaks to something that we always talk about when we do these parks programs. And that is if you are interested in being involved in parks and being involved in conservation, there's so many different roles you can get involved with. You can be an aquarium manager. You can be a heavy equipment operator, a biologist, a filmmaker, someone who's coming in and documenting this so that we can share stories like this with kids. And so if you guys are keen, you don't need to be a PhD. You don't need to follow a set career path. You can just get involved in so many different ways. And it's such an exciting opportunity to make a real positive difference in the world. Um, Miss Haas class, I'm going to head back to you guys now if you have a question for us. I'll take a couple from YouTube. We're going to take a few more from our classes today, but I will note that we do have a Padlet as well. So if you have additional questions, if you don't get everything answered live over the next seven minutes or so, you can always go to the virtual whiteboard below, share your questions, and Lori will check those out after the program is done. But Miss Haas class, grade fours, come on in, guys. Hey. Hi. Hi. Oh, if you could repeat that up close to the camera, or Miss Hoff could repeat it for us. Why did you just put the one fish yes. in a different river? Yes. Oh, yeah, because um, the West Slope cutthroat trout is a species at risk. So it'll be lots and lots of individual West Slope cutthroat trout, not just the one fish, but one type of fish that we're really interested in protecting and growing their population here. Because years ago, they used to live across most of Alberta, and now you can only find West Slope cutthroat trout in 5% of their original habitat. So their, their habitat's really shrunk. They've been outcompeted by other kinds of fish. So we want to give them a special place just for themselves so that this kind of species can survive. Fantastic. If you want to check out our other programs on West Slope Cutthroat Trout, which has always been my hardest animal name to say of everything, but I, I nailed it there, so I'm really proud of myself. Uh, go to our YouTube channel. All our programs with Banff, with the Parks Canada team are on our channel. You can type in trout in the search bar. You'll find those programs as a nice follow-up and compliment to today's program. Now, we've got a question on YouTube that I absolutely love. So you showcase this great thing where the, the trout can go down, the fish below can't come up. So if the trout 
the West Slope do go down, can they get back up or now they stuck? No, they're stuck too. Everybody's stuck. They don't have magic flying powers. Good to know. Okay. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't give them jet packs, so they can't okay. come back up once they exit the the creek. But the the whole point of the creek is to provide them with a good spawning ground and and a home base, right? So that those those West Slope cutthroat trout can have a healthy population within Cascade Creek and then spread out into the Bow River and repopulate in the Bow River and, and reestablish a home base there too. Fantastic. Great question, guys, on YouTube. Uh, great four or seven persons. Come on back in and join us. Hey, guys. How many animals have you saved so far? Ooh. Oh, well, that's hard to count yeah. because... Parks Canada does a lot of different things to save animals in different ways, right? We've got our wildlife crossings on the Trans-Canada Highway with the fences that keep animals from crossing the road. So um, we can only guess at how many animals we've actually saved. It's something that's very, very hard to count. But um, we do take notice, you know, are we getting more animals struck on the highway or fewer? And with the fences and highway crossings, there are fewer. And uh, as Jesse does throw out to our past programs, uh, we actually have a great one on the animal crossing structures and wildlife corridors and you can see me talking some more in that one <laughs> it's one of my favorite programs we've ever had on for anyone i know we've got some classes that are in the banff area which is really exciting you will have seen these in person if you've ever visited you will have seen them but it really is a remarkable conservation success not just on a canadian perspective but like a worldwide like people come from around the world to see this in action because it's so effective it's such a cool strategy for saving wildlife so i really encourage you to check this out uh just a special special project and Lori's the best host of all time so it's a good program uh let's head to um oh so many classes today folks we're gonna go with everyone actually we have enough time for all that um can more crew if you guys want to unmute your mic and come on back in for a second question you are good to go hey yeah you can come on up don't be shy hello um i don't think we have more questions Oh, that's okay. If Who's been to Cascade Creek or Cascade Ponds or done a legacy trail? Hey, look at that. That's awesome, guys. Well, if you do have any more questions, you can let me know in the chat or you can share on that Padlet. Again, you'll be able to write this after the broadcast. We'll leave it up for two days so if you want to check it with anything else. But it's so nice to have a class right down the road that's all been to the Cascade Creek. What a special, special thing. Um, it's very Golden, we're coming back to you. Don't worry. I, I see your hands up. You guys are so energetic. I love it. Uh, unmute your mic. Come say hi with me again. Hello, BC. Oh, hello. Oh. 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 Okay. Hey, oh, Anna has a question. Does that have to do with the stream? Hey, Anna. Uh, what type of animals did you say? What types of animals have you saved, Lori? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, everything from the little tiny Banff Springs snail that lives in the hot springs and only lives here in Banff. Um, right up to grizzly bears. So big and small, we take care of them all around here. I love it. Thank you so much for mentioning the snail. They're so unique. That's such a cool little spot. And I love it so much. Um, I'm going to head to Mr. Fortis and Ms. Hoff's class to wrap up live in a minute. But we did get a question from someone on YouTube that I want to share. Are you allowed to catch and release uh, with your family in the national parks or do you have to leave these fish alone in the creek? Yes, catch and release uh, fishing is uh, allowed with a license. So okay. we do encourage you certainly to look up uh, your species ID, become familiar with what fish or what, and um, abide by those regulations. All right, I'm pulling up the email or the, the address of the website for you guys, so pc.gc.ca with weird caps uh, that I put in there. If you want to check out more on that, uh, Patricia, if you want to learn about fishing, I encourage you to check that out and, and learn more. All right, Miss Paul's class, I'm coming to you, and then Mr. Ford is to wrap up. Come on in, grade fours. Hey, yes, you. Yeah. Very, too energetic. You're good to go. Ask <laughs> again. Are the fish doing well? Are the fish doing well? Yeah. Uh, so far, so good. Yeah, we are going to be reintroducing the West Slope cutthroat trout this summer. So we don't have those fish in the Cascade Creek yet. Um, but so far, so good with the baby fish. So we're hoping. Yeah. I, I hope so too. I'm so excited to follow up next fall and find out how things are going. Uh, Mr. Ford has one last question to wrap us up. Uh, come on in and take us away. All right. We have a question, Leah. 
Do some of the native trouts have the same life cycle as Atlantic salmon? Because we're raising Atlantic salmon. Ooh, great question. How That's cool. so cool. Good for you guys. They have a slightly different life cycle because these are freshwater fish and your Atlantic salmon are saltwater and freshwater fish. So they're slightly different in that way. Um, so our fish live in our creeks and rivers all year round and our lakes too. Um, and they don't migrate to the ocean and back into fresh water. So that's how our salmon, or our trout and your salmon are different. Although they are kind of cousins. That is so, so cool. So Mr. Fortas's class is joining us in Toronto, which is where I grew up. I had the chance to do that with my class. It's such a special opportunity. So lucky you guys as a classroom. That's so much fun. I, I can't wait. Join us for more fish programs. We'd love to hear how those fish are doing in the future. Lori, uh, this has been so much fun. I'm going to ask one final question of you in a minute, but I do want to know for anyone who's keen to find out more, head to our YouTube channel generally for all those past programs if you want to check some great stuff out. Uh, we are on the Peak Discovery web or web page on exploringbytheseat.com. Uh, if you want to learn more about this incredible mountain park series of all the places in BC and Alberta, the butterfly effect specifically is coming up February 7th. So in just a week now, a week today, you have the opportunity to join us again. I know a lot of you are signed up, but please do check that out. And again, if you want to share additional questions with Lori, inundate her with all your fish queries, uh, padlet.com, our initials slash creek. I'll make sure all our registered classes have that link as well. But Lori, is there a final message you want to share with us about the work that you guys are doing? Anything to leave off our kids with before we bring everyone in to say goodbye? I am so excited to share with you, this doesn't have anything to do with fish, but it's lots of fun, is our new wildlife rules music and videos. So this is something that you can use in your classroom, you can share it, you can sing the songs, uh, you can come and see us in live shows this summer. Um, so our wildlife rules music, uh, Jesse, if you want to throw that, uh, it's, it's a very long web address, but if you'd like to throw that <laughs> I put it on YouTube and StreamYard so any of our classes can check that out and I'll make sure that all our registered classes get it in email as well. But it's such a cool resource and uh, I hope you do take the chance to check it out. Such fun. <laughs> awesome. Lori, uh, always such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. And as you well know what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teacher friends to say a big thank you and farewell. So Mr. Ford is seven person school. We've got the off. Hey, Amor, we're going to have a little golden baby. Wait, 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 w